1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in, in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Gabrielle Anderson Scheiss. Um, maybe some of you know her story. At the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, the inaugural women's marathon, uh, she was entered representing Switzerland. And with temperatures hitting nearly 30 degrees Celsius with Humidex feels like 40, uh, they embarked on this inaugural marathon. Now, Unfortunately for Gabriella Anderson Scheiss, uh, who you see in the picture, uh, she missed the fifth and last hydration station. And so she became dehydrated. And as she entered the stadium for the final 400 meters, uh, her entire body was seized. And that's why in this picture, she appears the way she does, almost contorted, because her entire body was cramping her torso was twisted, her left arm limp, her right leg just like a stick and, and barely able to move. And so the medical personnel seeing this, they ran to her and she quickly with whatever movement she could and even through pain, uh, just, just uh, pushed them away without touching them. Just, just said, don't touch me because the rule is if anyone touches you, including medical personnel, then you're immediately disqualified. And in her mind, she was determined to finish, and she barely limped across the finish line. And she came 37th out of 44, but just the fact that she finished has gone into Olympic lore. And that's why you hear the story today. Now, just try to imagine, literally, if you were in her shoes and you were experiencing this kind of pain, uh, what would be your motivation to finish? I wonder what was her motivation to finish? What was her strength to push through? The Christian life certainly is similar. If we think of this marathon as a metaphor for life, it's similar but different. Um, it's similar in that certainly the Christian life needs to be for the long haul. In fact, we need to have an eternal perspective on life, not just that this life is this life, the, you know, the years we live, and then when we die, that's it. No. So in that sense, it's similar. But unlike this literal marathon, we need a doctor for our souls. We need medical, the medical personnel of our souls, if you will, to be able to touch us. Whereas in this literal marathon, she would have been disqualified. If we're going to finish this race of faith, this marathon of faith to the end, we actually need, in contrast, for Jesus Christ, we have to let him touch our hearts, our minds, because actually it's the opposite. If we don't let him touch us, if we don't let him cover us, if we're not united to him, then we'll actually be disqualified. So as we continue on through Peter's letter, there's certainly this theme of running the race, of persevering. And hopefully just even in the reading of Scripture, you caught some of that. That there's this genuineness of, of joy and faith despite whatever trials. And so my hope and prayer for all of us is... Uh, one big takeaway out of whatever else, however else the Spirit speaks to you, uh, it would be a prayer, wanting to relate to God by faith in some manner similar to this. Lord, help me to deal with suffering in my life 
specifically, uniquely as a disciple of Jesus. Because I hope to show you in a few moments that the world certainly has their way of dealing with suffering. But Christians are called to deal with suffering uniquely as a disciple of Jesus. So Lord, help me to deal with suffering in my life as a disciple of Jesus. I think Peter uh, addresses this, not the whole story on suffering, but certainly a very important aspect of, of how we deal with suffering as a disciple of Jesus. So I want to ask, um, just for the rest of our time together of the passage, what perspective, because it's really a perspective that is unique to the Christ follower. What perspective on suffering does Peter want disciples of Jesus to have? And I want you to see with me first how not to suffer. Okay, How not to suffer. Second, to be able to ask the question and answer it, why? Why do we suffer uh, as Christ followers? What's our unique perspective? What's the whole point of suffering? And finally, third, who? Who suffered for me? Okay. So first, how not to suffer. Now, how not to suffer actually comes out uh, of the positive point, how we should suffer. As we pick up in verse 6, Peter says, in this you rejoice. So first of all, uh, I know I highlighted this, but now in hindsight, I wish I also highlighted rejoice. I want you to see that he's asking us to rejoice. And he's speaking in the context of, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And again, we know that the context of Peter writing this letter was to Christ followers experiencing persecution because specifically of their faith. And so there's supposed to be in the Christ followers perspective, in the heart, in the thinking, many of us, we, we live by sort of pain pleasure balance, right? And we make decisions or we stop things or pursue things as long as the pleasure outweighs the pain. And Peter is kind of playing on that. He's speaking to that just natural human way of thinking. And he's saying, for the Christian, you most certainly have something that can cause you to rejoice that is greater and outshines whatever darkness and suffering and trial in your life. That needs to be the strong, cemented thought of a Christian. So what's this? Peter's asking us to rejoice in this. What's this? This, the this, in, in this you rejoice, is the verses prior. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 5. And what is Peter? We preached on that last week. We went through that last week. But just in summary, we see in those verses right prior, first, an eternal perspective. Because Peter speaks of our inheritance, our salvation future that we're looking forward to. Okay, an eternal perspective. And second, a Christ-centered perspective. Peter speaks of the fact you're rejoicing. Blessed be God the Father because he has caused us to be born again to a living hope in Christ Jesus who is resurrected from the dead. And so Peter is speaking of a Christ-centered perspective an eternal perspective and a Christ-centered perspective. And Peter's saying that's the this. Because of that eternal perspective and your life is centered on Christ and what he's done for you and what he's accomplished, therefore, you can rejoice even through trials. Now, this is, that's how we should suffer, but let's talk about how we should not suffer then. Because that perspective, this, this that Peter's speaking of is diametric opposed to how the world approaches suffering, which is how we should not suffer. So how does the world suffer? And this is how we should not suffer. The world, as I do my best to think about it and boil it down, I think one common tie in the way the world generally approaches suffering is short-sightedness. Short-sightedness. Me meaning the way we think about our suffering is just about how to deal with it so that it makes our life better now. And so short-sightedly, the world first tries to eradicate, to completely erase suffering. That's one way we, uh, the world tries to deal with suffering. Now, case in point, I'll be the first to say that I appreciate ibuprofen. <laughs> I appreciate Advil, no-name Advil, you know, whatever it is. 
uh, because it helps with symptoms when you're sick. And I don't like to feel the symptoms if I don't have to when I'm sick. And so we just generally as humans, we try so hard to mitigate suffering. We, we try to exercise our control, our mastery of life, and we do whatever we can to mitigate suffering, even to get rid of it. Just another case in point. For example, there, there's a, a branding that's proliferated, a saying that's proliferated in the fight against cancer. And for certain, cancer is evil. Even my own family um, has suffered uh, just the effects of cancer in our lives and losing loved ones. And so for certain, cancer is evil. Cancer is sad. And so understandably, and here's the branding that's proliferating. Maybe you've heard it. You go to a lot of these cancer fundraisers and there's even organizations that have taken on this name. And then just saying this to illustrate the point, they, they say, F cancer. That's how angry they are, right? That's how angry they are at sickness, disease, suffering. Here's the point. As humans, we do our utmost to try to erase suffering and even to try to slow down death. But as they also say, one thing, the one thing that money can't buy is youth. So we know that. People know that. And yet our world continues to writhe and struggle and putting all our best intelligence, our effort to be healthier, to slow down death, to, 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 again, just to erase suffering. But if we're honest, and the past two and a half, three years or so have really shown this, we fear death. We avoid talking about death. And we work tirelessly to extend life as long as we can. But another irony is that as we stressfully try to figure out how to fight death, that stress oftentimes accelerates, you know, just our own journey towards death. Now, in contrast, then, Christ followers, we don't try to erase suffering. We know that it's actually a part of life because Christ followers have an eternal perspective on suffering, meaning Christ followers understand that suffering fits into history. Suffering fits into even the plan of God. It's not something that we should try to get rid of, per se, because what suffering does is it points to eternity. It points forward to eternity and points backward to the fact that we believe, where did suffering come from in the first place? Suffering is just a symptom of sin. Suffering is a symptom of the fact that Adam and Eve failed. They sinned, and therefore sin and death and disease all entered our lives. And even not only physically ruined us and our health, but relationships. And so Christ followers, in contrast, because we have an eternal perspective on suffering, we understand that instead of wanting to completely erase it, that this actually points to something beautiful, meaning the true answer for our suffering, which is Jesus. See, if you feel the need to eradicate suffering in your life, and especially Christian brother and sister, if you ever feel the need, I want to minimize the suffering in my life, it might be betraying it might be betraying your belief that you believe this life is it. That's why the world's approach to suffering is to try to erase it because they know this life is it. That's what they believe. This life is it. And so I have to extend this life as long as possible because they haven't either thought of the next or they fear the next or whatever reason, but their focus is this life. And so even Christian. We need to look in the spiritual mirror of God's word today and, and ask, how do I deal with suffering? And am I dealing with it as a Christ follower, as he would have me? Now, a second way how not to suffer then is the world really tries to idolize suffering. And what I mean by that is um, using suffering to make you a more beautiful person. Okay? And, and really, at the end of the day, what's at the center there is the self because you're worshiping yourself. You want to become your best self. 
the athletic world um, is really well versed in all this. And so just some examples, quoting, I'd rather regret the risks that didn't work out, meaning I'd rather have suffering in my life than the chances I didn't take at all. Simone Biles, one of the greatest Olympians in history. The only way to prove that you're a good sport is to lose. Ernie Bank. But again, meaning suffering's good because that's what makes you a winner. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and miss. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Michael Jordan, right? Uh, moving on to outside of sports. If I could talk to my younger self, I would just say that the path to great things is filled with a lot of stumbles, suffering, and challenges along the way. But if you have the right attitude and know that hard times will pass and you get up each time, you will reach your destination. Johnny Kim former Navy SEAL, Harvard Medical School grad, NASA astronaut. <laughs> what a resume. But the common tie between all these things is the way the world approaches suffering is, okay, really at the heart, if we're honest, it's because I want to succeed. I want to become everything glorious. It's about self-worship. And if suffering can serve that, then we're willing to even idolize suffering, make it a part of our lives. Now, on the other hand, another way some of us idolize suffering is, I'll, I'll put it this way, just read a survey the other day about attitudes towards suffering, and one question read, and you're supposed to check the box if this is you, I'm often anxious over felt needs like relationships, money, health. I often feel I'm all alone and nobody cares. I'm not a happy camper, <laughs> right? And so these are the kind of people who often have the thought, hey, if I'm not happy, you're not allowed to be happy. But that's another way we idolize suffering. We make it so much about ourselves that we want other people to suffer with us as well. It's just the other side of idolizing suffering. And so they want people to commiserate, but an emphasis on the misery in commiseration. Now, in contrast, that's how we shouldn't suffer. In contrast, Christ followers we don't worship ourselves in our suffering. And we'll unpack this more later toward the end of, of the sermon, but we worship Jesus in his suffering. Why? Because first, just as a preview to the end of the sermon, Jesus' suffering is the one suffering that God is happy to vindicate. Like put it this way, you think of a typical criminal case, criminal standing before the judge, and sadly, oftentimes, there's a, a broken story behind the criminal's life. There's a reason why the criminal became the way he or she did in life. But how often, how often does the judge say, you know what, I feel sorry enough for you that I'm just going to let you go? No, that's not how it works, even in our legal system. How much more with God? We, we can't just bring our broken, sad stories before God. He is a just God. And he has to punish sin. And he will bring it all to justice. And where we want to be able to say, but God, I suffered in my life. Don't you see what I went through? Jesus' story of suffering is the one story that God will accept and vindicate that suffering story. And so in contrast, where the world is so short sightedly just about my comfort, my wanting to erase pain and suffering from my life, in contrast, we have an eternal perspective that suffering is part of life because of we look back and where it came from and we look forward to God's plan of redemption and that his, he's all the more glorified because of how he deals with suffering and therefore we focus on Jesus. We focus on Jesus. That's so different from the world. So, why then? Why? Do you and I suffer uniquely as Christ followers? Hopefully we caught that just how not to suffer, but in contrast to how we're called to suffer. And Peter's saying rejoice in this, that eternal perspective and Christ-centered perspective. 
But now, why? What's the reason? So one simple answer for today. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while. So again, eternal perspective. Love how one commentator put it, our life here on earth and whatever trials you go through even in a hundred years of life is barely a parenthesis on your entire life story in Christ. And so here, focus on if necessary. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. All the commentators that I read, they agree that this if necessary, it basically simply points to God's design. That God has designed this. That he is allowing it. And there's comfort here, although, yes, by default, our story, our background story is we're living in a fallen creation. There's sin and suffering and brokenness in this life. That's the default. But it's not that God necessarily wants us to suffer. He's not a sadistic God who is trying to um, intentionally make our lives miserable. But if necessary, and we'll get to the reason why, sometimes this is by God's design. Okay, so first we need to accept that first truth. God does allow suffering in our lives at times, if necessary. Now, before we unpack that more, let's be humble and let's be truthful uh, before God. Some of our suffering is self-inflicted. Okay, and so today, if you're going through some difficult time, you have to humbly and honestly ask, okay, if I'm going through some difficult times, how much of this is self-inflicted, a consequence of my own choices? But certainly, you read through Scripture, and it's convincing that some of our suffering is certainly from Satan. Because certainly there is a spiritual enemy who will seek, especially for Christ's followers, to thwart your faith, to sabotage your faith, and he will also do whatever he can to keep people from faith in the first place. But sometimes there it's not even suffering. Sometimes it's success that he might use. But certainly the point being, some of our suffering is from Satan. And therefore, we need to know, just have another set of IQ, spiritual IQ, and just how to approach suffering. That we need to depend on God. We need to approaches with prayer. We need to hold on to the precious promises of Scripture in Christ. Some of our suffering is science. And what I mean to say by that is I do believe that God, He is sovereign. Yes, He's, he's over all of history, but He's also set certain things in motion. And, and so when natural disasters happen, when Canada is hit by Fiona, these are things of nature and things that just happen, things out of our control. When our bodies are suffering, it's because scientifically things are breaking down. Of course, you can still tie that all back to sin entering, but the point being, just some things happen. But, but, please hear this clearly, but all, all of our suffering is under God's sovereignty. And in His goodness, His design, as we submit our suffering to Him, as we seek to be united to Jesus in His suffering, then the hope of the Christian is that we, we have the most brilliant hope that our suffering will indeed be redeemed. Redeemed. And that's why Peter says here, and this is the why, if necessary, and here's the why, so that, that's the why. So that. Here's the reason. The tested genuineness of your faith. Now Peter says, notice, he compares it to earthly treasures. More precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. Again, Peter is exhorting us. He's wanting to encourage us to take on an eternal perspective in life. And what's an eternal perspective in life? What's the story of life? Basically, you live this life. It's a test. It's a test. It's a temporary test. And the point is to cross the finish line. And when we cross the finish line, that we may be found 
to be resulted in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. On judgment day, when Christ returns for a final time, and what will be revealed, what will be found, what will be the result, what will be praised and given even glory by God himself and honor, the tested genuineness of your faith. That's the point of suffering. Suffering certainly draws out who you really are in the moment. It draws out who you are. And I'll even be the first to say, I have my moments of weakness where even I say something that I regret from, you know, something comes out of, off my tongue. But that situation, that suffering, that trial, it really tested and who I really am came out. That's how suffering works. That's one purpose of it. Now, this word here in, in the Greek is, you don't get it in English, but if you look at it in the Greek, they're the same words from the same root. And so in the English, you could read this. You get the, more of the vibe of, of the, how Peter wrote it. So that the tested, testedness. Meaning, there's an emphasis on being tested. And so, fact of life. God does test. He tests. But what's the point? Not to see if... The point is, he's not. you know, there's some mean teachers and they just write tests that are impossible because they got to lower the average or the bell curve or whatever, right? I've had a few of those teachers in my life. Um, no, it's the opposite. It's almost like God wants to... The whole point of this journey, and we see it in earlier in verses 1 and 2, the point of the Christian life is that we're sanctified by the Spirit. The point, one purpose you have while on this earth, and if you never knew this, just believe it now and let it cement in your perspective on life. One point of your time on earth is to become more and more as Christ-like as you can by God's grace. By God's grace. To be sanctified by the Spirit. And so this tested testedness, this testing of the genuineness of your faith is to make you more and more Christ-like, to draw out where you're not like Christ yet, where there's room for maturity. Now, if we're honest, all of us, we want the product of trials and pain, meaning maturity, but without having to go through the process. But what Peter is making clear is no, there's no shortcut around this process. And so whatever trial or suffering you're facing right now, from something small to something larger than what feels like larger than life, it's by God's design. And we, therefore, we need to ask, what is God trying to teach me here? Now, God is consistent throughout history. And so one example from the Old Testament, Second Chronicles chapter 32, King Hezekiah. And so in the matter of the envoys of the princes of Babylon who had been sent to him to inquire about the sign to Hezekiah, um, the sign that had been done in the land, God left him, King Hezekiah, to himself in order to test him and to know all that was in his heart. This is one way God relates to us. And so it's helpful to just understand, okay, if there are difficult times in my life, Let's fulfill its purpose by God's grace. And again, God's desire, God's goal, so that all of this may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Have you ever seen a parent with, or an uncle or an aunt or a friend of a family and, and, and a child is just starting to learn to walk? Just the smile, the rooting heart to that child. And even if they stumble and fall, just the love and affection that's poured out on that child. I think that's the kind of sentiment we're to understand and take and take into our hearts that, that God, what he, he really is for His people. That through these tests, that your faith will, like gold being refined by fire, it's even more precious, more important than earthly treasures that you'll be able to stand and walk and even run and result in praise and glory and honor at the end. God wants his children to finish. Just to convince you all the more, James writes something very simple in his letter. 
verse 12 of chapter 1, blessed, happy, supremely happy is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. And so here we get the notion, James is even giving some timeline. The crown of life is at the end, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so when he has stood the test, not just one test, it's not just yesterday's test or tomorrow's test, but really all of life the test, the span of your life. So some application questions to help you hopefully track with this. What is the Spirit trying to teach you? Are you do you have your finger on, on that pulse? Can you say, even thinking about this past week, this past month, maybe you're in a season of life, what is the Spirit trying to teach me? Put it another way, how is the Spirit trying to mature you? How is the Spirit trying to mature you? Maybe to make some of us feel a little bit more uncomfortable. (laughs) What trial keeps repeating in your life? What trial keeps repeating in your life? Maybe then we're not learning the lesson. (laughs) Maybe then... And I'm not saying that as a blanket statement. Again, some suffering is inflicted, some suffering is Satan, some suffering is just science. But in all of this, God is sovereign. And so as we see certain trials that keep repeating in our life, maybe I finally just wake up, especially if it's a self-inflicted suffering. I need to wake up and just confess and repent and say, Lord, okay, I need help. I need your grace. But all of this is bearable. Actually, beyond bearable. Peter says, rejoice. Rejoice. Be happy if there are various trials in your life. Because of the one who suffered for us. And where do we see this? As he continues on in verses 8 to 9, though you have not seen him. Who's him? It's Jesus. And he's already, what has he already said about Jesus? that we are born to a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Meaning Jesus died on the cross for you and me. And Peter, for certain, being someone from his own testimony, his own life, who can speak to scandalous, mind-blowing grace of God through Jesus. And I love Peter's heart here. His pastoral heart. He knows these people, they never got to historically, physically see Jesus. And so he's meeting him in that. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. And this is what I want you to notice. Believe, rejoice, filled, obtaining. These are all present it's in the right here and now Peter's saying you now in this moment believe in him you rejoice and even this phrase obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls because he uses the word outcome you might be led to believe that he's speaking to future salvation but no this is present tense Meaning, even now, you have the fullness of your salvation, even as you wait, the fullness, fullness of it, being welcomed home to the new creation. Meaning, we have all the inexpressible joy and benefit and even the glory right now as we walk by faith with Christ. So true Christianity here. I think Peter is describing true Christianity. John Piper was helpful for me in just thinking through this. True Christianity is, is, is loving Christ. is trusting Christ and enjoying Christ. As you go through your sufferings, if the end result, if, if what really settles, even through your suffering is, I love Christ more because of how he's loved me. I trust Christ more because of how he suffered for me. And I want to enjoy Christ more because that's the one pleasure that can outshine what I'm going through. 
That's what Peter's getting at. Now, to encourage you, here's an artist's rendition of the Sermon on the Mount. And I think literally there were thousands upon thousands of people who physically saw Jesus, but they didn't truly see him. So don't feel like you're missing out if, you know, and sometimes you play that game with friends, just little mind game, mind, fun little mind experiments. If you go back into any time in history, you know, where would you want to go? And maybe some of you, it's like, I'd love to be able to see Jesus. But I want to encourage you that the way God has just left faith life for us in the Spirit and with the Word in the church, there were many people who physically saw Jesus but didn't truly see Him. So you're not missing out on anything in that sense. And all the more, if you're filled with the Spirit, staying in His Word, staying connected to the church, then you can see Jesus so much more lucidly and clearly crystal clearly than these thousands of people who actually saw Jesus physically. And so, just to read one of John Piper's thoughts on this passage, joy in Christ is the deep good feelings in loving Him and believing Him. It's the echo in our emotions. I love that little phrase there. It's the echo in our emotions, our hearts, of experiencing Christ as precious and experiencing Christ as reliable. It's the deep, good feelings of being attracted to Him for who He is and the deep, good feelings of being confident in Him for what He will do. And so your joy, it really, the quality of your joy and happiness in this life, it will be reflective of what you put your joy in. Because you can take joy in less noble things. You can take joy and laugh at dirty jokes. But that joy, then the quality of it, the moral quality of it is so shallow and, and not noble. You might take joy in taking revenge in masterminding some move at the office politically. But what does that reveal of, of your character? You might take joy in material things, but that joy is going to perish. In contrast, if we take joy in Christ, the preciousness of Christ, and trust His reliability, that's why Peter says, in this you rejoice, though you're going through suffering. So William MacDonald, he reflects, the Christian's joy is not dependent on earthly circumstances, but on the risen exalted Christ at God's right hand, it is no more possible to rob a saint of his joy than it is to unseat Christ from his place of glory. The two stand together. The two stand together. So, would you pray this with me? If it's in your heart, I just invite you to um, read this prayer from me, uh, uh, with me um, as we close this sermon. Lord, help me to deal with suffering in my life as a disciple of Jesus. Mm -hmm.